You're listening to the Mistress of None podcast with Erin Harks. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Mistress of None. This is Erin Harks. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, first of all, apologies. I went MIA. Um, I joke that not many people are listening anyway, so nobody really noticed, but I am trying to get better at making this a regular thing and making sure that I am um, being consistent and I, I'm ready to do that now. I needed a little time. Um, I took some time around the holidays after the special came out just because I was completely burnt out. Uh, this last time, though, I want to be really honest with everybody. The reason I took time off was um, I was honestly tired of myself. I really felt like I didn't have anything to say. Um, I was kind of going through something, which I'm still kind of going through, and uh, it's okay because uh, it's getting better now. But um, it's been an interesting month and a half or so with uh, just a lot going on. And as many people know, like I made a big transition from playing the cover gigs, uh, solo stuff a while back and tried to focus more on the comedy and some other stuff. And it hasn't really been panning out the way I hoped um, I lack patience, so it's not that it's never going to work out. It's just not working out right now. And the thing that's tough with uh, people like me and people that do what I do is that sometimes the littlest setback can feel like the biggest failure. And I am getting better at trying to not catastrophize everything that goes wrong, which is, which is hard work. Now there's always been, and I've talked about this before with some of my guests, even, um, especially with, uh, Kelly McFarland, actually, she was one of my first guests, one of my favorite comedians. And we talked about the correlation between, uh, comedians and mental health and the, the, the dichotomy of like feeling, honestly borderline suicidal and then having to go get up and make people laugh for a few minutes is will forever astound and fascinate me uh it it it's really it's really tough I mean I'm not comparing what I do to people who save lives and stuff like that or anything but it's uh it's definitely interesting and you can't have an off day when you do that kind of thing And it was funny because I had this one day in particular where I was bawling my eyes out and I got a phone call from somebody that I've been trying to connect with and do some business with. And you would have thought that I was like (laughs) a mental patient, though no offense to mental patients, whatever, Uh, the way I turned it on just to get through the phone call. I honestly like freaked myself out a little bit because I went from like sobbing to like not being able to catch my breath to be like, hey, how are you? Wonderful. Thanks. Sounds great. So that's I mean, that's a that's a gift. So I'm again trying not to be too hard on myself when it comes to certain things. I think about my shows like Cafe Lena and my uh, Women Aren't Funny at UPH and how years ago selling 60 to 80 to 100 tickets on a Wednesday night in the wintertime would have seemed completely unachievable. And now if I don't sell out, for some reason, I feel like I've failed. And as much as I don't want to feel that way, I know that there's a certain element of that that I have to hold on to. Otherwise, I will get complacent and I won't stop trying and I won't stop working hard. And so... We just have to find a delicate balance. And that's what we're working on right now. Uh, So, yeah, so I was just kind of sick of myself. I didn't really feel like I had anything to say or share. Um, I hadn't really interviewed anybody in a while, but I'm back at it. I'm ready to go. I'm feeling better. I just finished kind of my new office, which I'm recording in right now. It was my workshop during the pandemic. Um, Oh, wow. Wow. The day that I'm recording, yep, March 14th, four years ago today, was the day that everything kind of shut down. And (laughs) the day before everything happened, I made myself a t-shirt that said, wash your fucking hands. 
um, I was making light of what was going on because obviously I did not realize the extent of what was about to happen. I, I really did not realize the severity of it. And so I made this shirt and I wore it out to play on what ended up being my last gig for a while. And people liked the shirt and asked me about it and asked me if they could get one. So I started making shirts for other people and basically spent the next two years in this room making shirts and masks. And I'm very grateful for it. It wasn't the best, but when I was faced with my biggest fear, my biggest fear has been, I mean, besides the the major ones, my biggest fear was always that without any warning whatsoever, I would have to stop working and I wouldn't have any warning or any backup or anything. It would just be, I wouldn't be able to perform anymore. And I was faced with that in an instant. I was supposed to leave for tour on the 14th. Uh, the day before I started debating whether or not I should go and then I decided to cancel it but if I had waited like an hour it wouldn't have been up to me anymore every place that I was playing was like yeah we probably shouldn't um except for Florida Florida was like still come I'm like nah that's that's all right um I didn't want to get stuck there and um yeah so I ended up making masks and t-shirts and other things in my little workshop and it's just been kind of like a catch-all room since then where I just put like you know boxes and and other stuff and I've been downsizing if you remember my episode with my friend Jess Marcy who helped me uh downsize and declutter she's amazing you should check her out it's Jess with one s she jokes that she decluttered the second s but she came and helped me and I was able to get rid of I think like 25 bags of garbage and donations just out of my house. And now I have a nice little office and I'm hoping that that will cultivate some work, inspire some work, and I'll be able to start getting some things done and be a little bit more productive. So uh, today's episode, I met with uh, Jeff Buell. I won't give it too much of a lead up because we really talked a lot about the type of guy he is and who he is and uh, we were supposed to meet a couple of months ago and he got COVID and he had to cancel. And I put up a snarky post a few days ago and he messaged me and he said, I like the way you talk. Can we reschedule? And I said, absolutely. So we got together and it was just, it was honestly a great conversation. Uh, gave me a lot of hope for, um, you know, there's really good people out there that are trying to do good things and, I feel like I have cultivated a pretty decent relationship and I hope I get to work with him in the future because I like his ideas and I like what he had to say. So stick around. We've got Jeff Buell coming up. This is the Mistress of None and I am Aaron Harks and we will be right back. You're listening to the Mistress of None podcast with Aaron Harks. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Mistress of None. My guest today is Jeff Buell. Jeff, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Are I'm, you okay? I'm good. <laughs> Jeff is making fun of me right now because we had some technical difficulties, uh, which should not surprise anybody. Um, I am still figuring out, you know, what I'm doing here as a recording person, podcaster, whatever. It's fine. Um, we had a nice conversation. Some of it's caught on tape. We'll, we might share that with you some outtakes. People. I do have outtakes. Yeah. While I'm saying that, I'm going to actually just check make sure. make sure that everything is recording so we don't do that again. And yeah, see? Wasn't recording. No, you can't take me anywhere. So <laughs> the video is now recording. So welcome to the Mistress of None again. This is Aaron Harks with Jeff Buell. Jeff love that name, Mistress of None. Thank you. Is there an origin story? There is an origin story. I was actually talking to uh, my good buddy, Matt Baumgartner, and um, he said, you do everything. And I said, yeah, but I don't do any of it well. <laughs> so I thought of the Master of None. I love it. Yeah, and but I was like also laughing that the the female equivalent of Master, for some reason, has to be Mistress, which is just, you know. It sounds patriarchy at its best there's right a, there's a lot of different ways that you could go <laughs> and then the, of course none is also you know it could also just be n-u-n if you really wanted to go with it i've had that i've had uh people ask about non 
because you know in, Indian yeah. bread, yeah, yeah. mistress of non. You could go a lot of different directions with this thing. I'll start a baking show. You could have an entire Halloween podcast <laughs> that is just a, all over the map, different you, segments. You are a good idea machine. That's not bad, right? Which is why I'm glad to have you I, on my podcast. <laughs> I'm going to be sincerely disappointed if the mistress of Nan does not make an appearance at Halloween <laughs> and what that costume looks like. Well, see, I don't know, though, because we you have gotta, to be careful. You can't appropriate. You we can't be careful. appropriate. But also, Nan is just delicious. So I, a way. I actually do make really good Nan. Better than your cakes? Better than my cakes. He's making fun of me again because something <laughs> happened with my oven last night. The best thing about the Nan is that it's stovetop, so... <laughs> Um, <laughs> it comes out really good, though. Does stovetop do a non? Yeah, they do. No, not stovetop like the stuffing. Oh, you mean like I you make cook it, it on, on the stove. stovetop? Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, in the frying pan. Yeah, which okay. makes those little brown bubbles on the yeah. top of it. The way I make non is super creative. Actually, I just place an order on. There we go, <laughs> and it shows up at my house. Once again, the good idea machine. Yeah, just pumping them out here. <laughs> I'm glad that this is recording because I have notes now to look back on and, and just be inspired for yeah. ideas for Halloween and baking and whatnot. Yeah. Um, this is exactly what we were intended to talk about. <laughs> great. There's never a format here, guys. You know that. Um, I did have, I wanted to start out though by asking, I um, admittedly, even though you told me beforehand, which we'll get back to, that we've actually known each other yeah. for quite well, some we time. we had met, right? We had met. <laughs> yeah. Um, but as... Everybody knows I am a, a dirty drunk and uh, now sober 13 years. So anything before 2010 doesn't count. So we met um, about 20 years ago. Yeah, 2004. So this is our do-over. Uh, but admittedly, you came um, on my radar with the chicken sandwich ah, thing. That's so exciting to hear. I love that that's how you know me. I do too, because since then I have been following. <laughs> yeah. And normally when somebody has a post as long as yours. Yeah, I do long form Facebook. I don't have anything to do with any of that. Yeah. Except yours. That's uh, an unbelievable compliment. I will read yours. Yeah. You have something to say. Uh, I'm a good storyteller. You really are. And I, um, I'm trying to um, lean into the fact that I know I am. But it's hard to say things like, I know that I'm good at this without appearing like an, an Eric. Can I swear on this podcast? Oh, yeah, you can. Without sounding like an asshole, right? Yeah. And, people, and I have people in my life who are like, do you ever worry that you're a little too arrogant? And I'm like, no, not really. Like, I'm just confident. And I guess it comes off that way. But, you know, in pra I do try to practice humility because you're better if you're doing that. Sure. And someone said to me the other day, um, you're the best storyteller I know. And I was like, eh, no, no. And they're like, no, no, really. You're a very good storyteller. Because you can't take a compliment. I can't. Okay. Um, I'm quite familiar with this dynamic. Yeah. But I love that what you just said because I, I was talking to someone yesterday. I was pitching a, a brand new idea for myself that um, I'm hopeful for. And I had to get my point across. I had to say, look, I'm a very good storyteller. And, and I turned it into self-deprecation as I've seen you have the ability to do and I said what's what's good for me is um, I don't expect people at the end of my um, social media post to say whether they liked it or they didn't I just like it if they got to the end yeah because then I did my job if right. you read the whole thing and like I write it's legitimate I write long form on social media which is counterintuitive it's why I'm not on Twitter I can't I can't do it there's not enough characters yeah. for so you. just that you said you finished is is amazing to me and makes my day i do normally if i see read more yeah you're done i'm done i do i don't have time yeah but i think we all do that even i do that but i think that the the arrogance thing and and we see it as arrogance sometimes but i'm, I'm quite familiar as are many other artists performers or you know storytellers have that element of self-deprecation where when you do have that bout of what you call arrogance, which is just some self-confidence, people don't see the violent oscillation <laughs> of when you are completely yeah. doubting yourself yeah. moments before. Yeah. Like this week, for, for example, this week I was having one of those, I'll never make it, I'm horrible at this, this is not going well for me. And just now I drove past MVP Arena and I went, someday. So it's like, who am I? <laughs> well, it's so interesting because... You, your reality right as like and let's say like i've 
viewed your path from afar, mm -hmm. right? As one, uh, it's the interesting part of social media is that you, you know, the high school reunion is gone because you don't need it because you know what everybody's up to. Exactly. Um, but you've already made it actually. That's awesome. Thank you. Well, this right, is like going to be just, it. I'm going to, I really like where this is going. Thank it's true though. Thank you. Right? Like, like regardless of where you're playing or what you're doing, you are living an existence that I know to be true to yourself. And that's making it. That's all you need to do. Right? Well, what else are you, you supposed to do? What's funny about that um, is when I quit my day job just over 10 years ago, I stopped saying things into the universe like I want to be rich and famous and started saying I want to make a living doing what I love. Mm. And yes, once I sized down the goals, I was able to achieve that. But it's funny because I guess part of me, it's a good thing that it's never enough because then I would stop grinding and stop, yeah. you know. But you, so you, but you didn't size down the goal. You size down the cultural expectation of your life, right? That's what you actually did. You looked and said, this is what society says I should be doing. Yeah. I'm not going to do that. And so we look at that and we think of ourselves, like even what you just said, it was almost a little bit of admonishment in your tone about what you did for yourself when really you just took a path that was going to lead to happiness. Yeah. Well, who the hell, why, why aren't we all doing that? Why are we not all doing that? I did, well, I mean, I, there, it's fair to say that I did size it down a little bit because I, I mean, I make attainable goals and then when I reach them, I'm like, where's my parade? Yeah. So, and as my husband <laughs> says, okay. fa famous for suckers, you know? So it's like, he goes, just just try and be rich, famous for suckers. And I really don't want to be famous. Um, I would like to be famous enough where I don't have to try so hard to sell tickets to my shows, but not anything beyond that because I already get creeped out with people that are like, hey, I know you. And I'm like, no. It's a good comment. It's a really, and it's, and it's hard to say out loud, right? Because again, um, we live in Albany, right? Mm -hmm. Like we are, we are a definitive tertiary pond, right? We're not big or small, we're tertiary. <laughs> and, and so when you say things like, um, you know, just for instance, let's just, let's just stick with the chicken sandwich silliness for okay. a second, right? Um, since I did that, which landed on the front page of the newspaper a couple times and on the TV. And like, there's a people like, people now look at me in public and I can tell that they recognize who I am. And I have no idea who I am. This isn't all the time. Right? Yeah. This is like from time to time, I'll be walking around and someone will be staring at me. And I know they're not staring at me because they're like, oh, wow, he's attractive. They're staring at me because they recognize who I am. Yeah. And it's just so weird that I don't know how actual famous people, I don't know how people who are, actually successful handle that yeah because it's a lot it, yeah it's a lot when someone walks up to you i had um an older woman walk up to me uh like two weeks ago and i was at one of our local social clubs that i despise with their dress codes and i won't <laughs> say it by name and uh, you better and she, spill the tea when she i hit was pause. like you're that guy and i was like huh and she's like just the chicken sandwich thing and i was like mm-hmm that's me. I'm the guy. I'm the chicken sandwich guy. Cool. Uh, for those that don't know, um, Jeff, how many sandwiches did you? Uh, it was like a hundred. Okay. And it was to Do you want, Yeah, like the actual story? Yeah, tell us the whole story. I mean, I, was, I know it, but. Yeah, I'm driving around the country over the summer and, you know, my first, um, I do two things first thing in the morning. Um, I read the newspaper and I play Wordle. And um, I'm reading the newspaper. I'm somewhere, I think I was actually in Maine. And the Times Union, which I appreciate as, um, for what it actually is, and, and you, need, you need journalism and you need local news to actually have a community. Um, so I'm not picking on them here. But they put a picture of Chick-fil-A on the front page of the Times Union for the second time in a week. And um, I don't, I don't care at all for the um, the political arguments around Chick Fil A. Like that's boring to me. Um, but what I do care about is the small business in our community that couldn't pay for that front page coverage in the Times Union. Mm. Right? You can't buy an ad to get on the front page of the TU. You have to do something newsworthy. And to me, some mega conglomeration selling chicken sandwiches. If that's news, it's sad news. Yeah. And. Um, 
you know, and then you get into, then I do have a, you know, a political argument with it of like, they're investing in the rich, they're investing in the richest places in our region and charging the cheapest amount for food as the pieces, as the places like that don't have money pay a lot more for food. And, and that's disturbing to me. So I was like, okay. And I just did this very, I'll call it innocuous um, Facebook post where I was like, I don't like this. And I yearn for the day where people are as excited about a restaurant opening in our downtown as they are Chick-fil-A, where they line up around the block. And because it's 20, you know, 24 now, but in 23 and any time post 2016, everything becomes political. Yeah. So I dared to pick a fight with, you know, the, the blessed chicken. And, um, <laughs> and I say that with like, I say that as a person who has a very strong faith foundation, but like it annoys me. Um, and, I picked a fight with Chick-fil-A, which wasn't really a fight with Chick-fil-A. It was just encouraging people to go to their downtown. And it took off. And all of a sudden, I went back to my Instagram or Facebook a couple hours later, and it had like, you know, 400 shares, which for a person that only has 3,000 friends and very carefully cultivates who he's friends with on social media, that's like viral. Yeah. That's Albany viral. Yeah. Um, and um, the amount of people that were shit-talking it, who were like, uh, screw you, these people pay good wages and they're investors too. And I was just like, I, I, I got to a, like a depressive state about it because I was only trying to make a good point. Yeah. And then I woke up the next day and I have like these odd eureka moments. And um, I just, <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna put my money where my mouth is. And I have uh, a couple tenants in Schenectady and I called one is the nest and i was like hey i got a crazy idea do you want to pick a fight with chick-fil-a we'll give away a hundred free chicken sandwiches and people will go crazy for it because people go crazy for weird things these days and to the times union's credit they put it on the front page okay and that i love how yeah. that comes back around yeah. like and that. it was like okay and then you know it's really great because you talk to the tenant and people are like oh what? you know because there's the pessimism on the internet you know, is not new to anyone, but boy, is it deflating. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so you get all the haters who are just like, oh, wow, you gave away 100 chicken sandwiches, who cares? But, um, and I think this is a great, um, a great note for the small business owners out there. Um, the week after that attention, they had their best weekend ever. That's great. It's and fantastic. That, that was the goal. Win, win, win. Yeah. 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 So I think I must have sent you the friend request just before that. And I, I think, but I know that it was right around that time because um, I was, I, I, you know, saw that happen and I watched it blow up and I was very impressed with it. And then I saw how you were just like traveling this like nomadic yeah. kind of journey yes. and meeting, you know, people at gas pumps and, and just having these really great conversations with them. And yeah. it was really, it was fascinating to me. And so I was glad to finally get the chance to just sit down and have a discussion with you and like, what, what, what fun. Um, if you had to write like a quick, like bio, like who is Jeff Buell, what would it say? Um, I love that you use the word nomadic because I feel a little like a nomad most of the time. Um, I haven't been able to find my, my place of settlement. Um, so I would say I'm a nomadic, kind hearted person just looking for the answers. Okay. Yeah. Which is weird <laughs> because like my day job and the way most people know me is I am a real estate developer. That's what and I wanted to. And those things are so in conflict yeah. with one another, right? They really are. I mean, it's yeah, that's what's uh, interesting to me and that you wouldn't choose a professional bio. You're choosing a like a personal no. spiritual bio. Yeah, you're not what you do. Sure. Right? You can't be what you, if you're what you do, you need to take a deep breath and readjust. All right. Cause you're going to be on your deathbed whenever that is. And you're going to be looking at yourself and saying, why did I waste all that time? Yeah. And, and again, super place of privilege. I'm saying this, right? Like I've been, I've been successful in real estate. And so I've been able to create for myself the ability to take six weeks off with, which I know most people cannot do. Um, and but you're self-employed. Yeah. My, so, yeah. So tell the people about your business, about Redburn. Um, so Redburn is a, is a merger of two different development companies, um, Redburn. And then my company was actually called sequence development, um, which I started about 10 years ago. Uh, actually it's more like 
12 at this point we're getting older um so about 12 years ago i um i worked for a great local company called the united group and um my boss there um you know you're you are who you meet in life um everything is so everything is just luck um and i met a guy and he became my mentor and like a second father to me and then he died in a plane crash oh my uh, god in clifton park um august 15th of 2012 oh and i it was just this moment where um you know things happen to you and the really dramatic ones stay with you and i can remember just driving home that night and i had a little place on burden lake and i went and sat in my hammock you know middle of august and i just turned on some music and i just sat and i sobbed and it was like well, what am I going to do with my life now? Because like this was my guy. Yeah. And uh, I quit a couple months later, and I started my own real estate company. And I had, I like, I laugh about it all the time. I had eight thousand dollars in the bank. Like, that's it. And you don't, you don't like launch a development company with eight thousand no. dollars, right? Like it's, <laughs> it's a little absurd. And um, I love talking about it because I think in the right to the right person it can be very encouraging yeah to the wrong person it can be detrimental because you have to be able to um self-sacrifice and lose a lot of yourself to me you know this right yeah like to do something that other people don't do there's a cost associated with it yeah uh and you know over the course of the following 12 years um myself and the two guys i ended up merging with we've developed 300 million dollars in albany um, and I started with eight grand. That's insane. It's wild. I right? know exactly what you're saying, though. Like, I've had people like, how did you quit your day job? And I'm like, listen, <laughs> it's yeah. not for everybody. It's not for everybody. And I made that mistake a long time ago. I would do um, I would do engagements with, like, the Capital Region Chambers Young Professional Networks. And I would get up there with a mic right here. And I can be my very gregarious self. And I'm just, like, engaging with people. And, um, and I would be like, you should all quit your job tomorrow. <laughs> And this was bef- this was like when I was in the birthing stage where I was like, the world's so easy, right? There's and that then, that confidence that that overly confident yeah. oscillation. And to, yeah, and then you have to walk through hell. Yeah. And now now it's like if somebody's like, well, I'm thinking about quitting my job, and I'm like, don't don't you dare, because <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's like it's not it's not easy, and it's not fun, and like you know like I'm. I, I like I grew up very in a very specific climate, right? Like we were we were lower middle class, but my parents made it feel like we were upper middle class. Yeah. And um and like I just assumed I'd uh, I'm 44. I just assumed I'd be married with a bunch of kids at this point. And like didn't happen for me. Um and I'm all right with it. Like I'm okay. Um I don't brag on it. No, but I think well, sometimes when you're really like focused on on a business and that becomes your your yeah, family in a sense sure and when you have and like hopefully people all have their moral compasses right so like in my business like i already gave you the the key ingredient like i had eight thousand dollars so like for me it was i'm going to search out people who want to invest in these ideas that i have and like once you make that commitment to someone like once you take someone's money to go do something like you just can't fail yeah right you have to you have to figure it out And figuring it out for me has looked like, you know, until last summer, figuring it out looked like 80 hour weeks for 11 consecutive years, Um, which is an extraordinary amount of work. And it's painful. And I I count these unbelievable blessings I've had where I've lost people close to me Mm -hmm. and like actually lost them like they died. Mm -hmm. And... um, selfishly they were all so beneficial for me because at different points i was able to stop and then last year i got to the point where it was just like i'm not going to do this until i end up in a grave right like i yeah i watch people in real estate especially um these hyper successful people are you always see died suddenly and like no they didn't die suddenly their, yeah. their last act may have been super sudden yeah but it was a result of the 30 years that they put themselves through where they weren't taking care of themselves. Yeah, they worked and, themselves to death. And like my, my actual reality, and this is where I become even more of a contradiction, 
is I'm a real estate developer who does not care about money. Um, I will, whatever I make in my life, I will give away. Uh, well, can I'm, I have some? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, you laugh, but I've invested in so many of my friends that have really wacky ideas that had like a 5% chance of success. Um, and one of them is going to hit it really big one time and I'm going to be like, look what I did. Um, <laughs> but in the meantime, I'm just going to give away everything I ever make in my life. Um, so if that's my end goal then I need to I need to take better care and I need to like be peaceful. Yeah. Well, yeah. we're going to go to commercial while I uh, take some of his money. And I'm just kidding. We don't have commercials on I was going to say you have commercials. We have this a commercial amazing. for Redburn. I'm kidding. No, there are no commercials yet. You yeah. know, maybe you could There's be. There's <laughs> your goal. There's your new goal. <laughs> I might have to watch my mouth if I get, you know, advertisers yeah. and stuff like that. And that's no fun. No. Although Joe Rogan pulls it off. Well, he's Joe Rogan. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I kind of love Joe Rogan. Eh. I just love, I love his, I don't love his personality and some of his beliefs. I just love the existence of a guy sure. who just sat down with a microphone who was once like the host of a game show and a fighter. Yeah. And now he's like, or now like he's a character actor. Now on like a, on entire a... segments of our population form their opinions off of his opinion. Yeah. And like, if there's not a better concept of what America can be, it's like, look at Joe Rogan. Yeah. That guy has hundreds of millions of people who actually listen to him. He was on a show called News Radio, which was only like two seasons, two or three seasons long. Wow. I didn't even know he was yeah, on. Yeah, and he wasn't even like a, a main character. I loved that show. Uh, I think Phil Hartman was yeah. on it until yeah. he sadly passed. And then like, I think John Lovitz took over. And that's when it like, yeah, got yeah, fucking yeah. tanked after yeah. that. Um, but yeah, he was like just this supporting character on it. Like, much like, you know, like a Kevin on The Office, like, you know, not on every episode, didn't have very many lines, but that was how I knew him. And then, you know, Fear Factor, which I did not watch because I have my own fears. Thank you very much. I don't need to be privy to other people yeah. eating bugs. Yeah. And then, yeah, I was like, oh, all right. So, yeah, beliefs and stuff, but the the the, the ability to create that kind of empire yeah, is obviously is something a, yeah. that, yeah. Same but. thing with Jordan Peterson, who like every time I hear him open his mouth, I just want to like throw my computer through a wall. <laughs> um, but then I, but I watch yeah. what he's able to, um, what he's able to, and it's very interesting. Like, I don't know if you talk politics much, but, um, but like the, the left of our country does a really bad job at like those cult like figures to like, sure. for, to get people to follow him. And it seems to be just the right, I don't know. It's interesting. It is an interesting time. My brain's weird. I'll go all over no, the place. Hey, yeah. I'm all about that. Yeah. ADD much? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what was funny uh, for me when I when I quit my day job, just to backtrack a little bit, and uh, within the first, because uh, it was around August when I decided to do it, and I had picked up like all of these summer shows, and summers obviously for a musician are the most lucrative. And so I quit in August, and then the show started to taper off and then you know like my car broke down and then these things were happening and I was like I had I what I did was a, it was a, I was at the county and I had six months of like a leave to see if it was something that I wanted to do so I had the option of going back and six months came I was fucking broke I was scared out of my mind and I went back for my meeting not knowing what I had decided and I walked into that building, and the second I walked in the building, I was like, fuck this. I cannot do this. I saw the security guard, like, hey, stranger, like, oh, fuck you, dude. Yeah. Fuck you, Steve. Yeah. You know? And yeah. I'm like, I was just, it felt like, oh. And I got on the elevator, and I got off, and I met with a woman, and I was like, yeah, I, I'm not, I can't come back. I, I got to make it work. I have to figure it out. It's so interesting because I have a very similar story. I worked for the city of Troy before I went to work in real estate. Okay. And uh, I did my time there. It's like a jail sentence, public service. Right? Uh, oh, yeah. It's very challenging, um, especially if you want to think for yourself. Exactly. Um, and I did seven years. And when I left. Exactly how long I did. <laughs> okay. Look at that. I did seven years and I left to go into real estate to go work for this other company. And I made a decision two weeks into my new job where I did something that looking back on it now was incredibly dumb. I cashed out my retirement plan. Mm. And I said to myself at the time, I don't want a safety net. I don't want to know that I can go back there and go do another 13 years and then retire and have that. It's just not, it's not who I am. Yeah. And uh, it's so interesting because I had somebody in 
government a couple of weeks ago say like, oh, you could come work for us again if you if you're looking to just take some time off and you know chill out. And I was like, yeah. And they're like, well, you must still have your pension plan. No, no, no. Yeah, I got rid of it. It's yeah. gone. I took away my safety net. But I'm glad to hear that you went back and immediately knew you weren't. Oh, the second the doors open, the second they buzzed me in, that was it. That was it. I mean, I'm I, I'm not a fan of small talk, and so I was never meant to be in an office setting because, like, you get on the elevator, somebody's like, "Well," and I'm like, "We don't we don't need to fucking talk, man. It's only two floors. You shut up, I'll shut up. We'll go about our day." And it was just like, because you know, it's like, I, I mean, I'm my body language yeah. is not inviting. You can't fake it. Yeah, and somebody's still gonna be like raining outside yeah i know it's fucking raining i didn't like come in some secret underground tunnel to get here like i'm aware of the weather we don't need to talk like so i like walk in and i saw this old security guard who like and i'm like oh god i just felt this dread wash over me but what was funny was when the uh, pandemic hit which was for me uh, my worst nightmare was that i would stop like work would stop without any warning whatsoever. I would just be out of work, whether it be a vocal cord injury or like something crazy like that. And all of a sudden that happened. And I remember there's one former boss from the county that I still get along very well with. I, I have a dinner with him and his wife. Like I, I just I adore this man. I adore his wife. I do a lot of work for her. She's an artist. I just love these people probably the only two from there that i still talk to yep. and he messaged me and he goes worst case scenario if you need and i was like i would rather die like i will figure this out i cannot walk it's a bold statement at a time where we all thought we might die <laughs> you were just and like, i was not being hyperbolic yeah i'm here for it i yeah i could not i couldn't even fathom going i appreciated that and him but no i couldn't do it either I don't know how I would, if I ever had to have a job, I, I couldn't do it at this point. And I mean, it's, I'm not shitting on that type of job. There are some people that I'm, I, I'm impressed with, like right out of high school, yep. went into civil service. They're going to retire in their thirties. Yep. They're going to have a full pension. I think that's fucking great. Yeah. It's just not for me. Not for me. Yeah. No. It's a it's a brain chemistry thing. It's actually not hard to figure out, right? Yeah. You, you just, some people are wired this way. Other people are wired this way. Yeah. But when you try to square whole round peg thing, you know, I guess pegs aren't round. Um, yeah. <laughs> I got uh, what you yeah, you that. know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I used to because uh, I I was just data entry, and so I and I say Oof. I say just Oof. data. Well, it was perfect though because like just drop your shit off. I'm going to enter it and then give you it back to, talk to you. To people. Exactly. Yeah. They would try to include me. I'm like, well, I yeah. don't know. We don't need to do that. I'm good. Um, but I don't say just that entry. Like I meant that like I obviously could have done more than that, yeah. but I didn't want to. It was just the job for me. So they'd be like, oh, you should take a test. You should do. And I'm like, I don't want to be here. I accrue 1.75 hours of personal time every week. And I go, all right, I'm going to take 0.75 of that on Friday. <laughs> like, you I know. can't even accrue. I'm no good at <laughs> I know, this. <laughs> I didn't accrue shit. I was like, here's when I'm going to take that. Like, That's good though. Cause you get these people. Like I, I saw another buddy of mine. I won't, I'm not going to name names cause it's rude, but he's, a local uh, police officer and um, I walked into a local city hall and he had he has the desk job at city hall and I said oh how'd you get this job now we were you know we worked together 30 years ago like first job we worked together right when you're a teenager yeah and he's like oh you know it's almost time to retire and I was like damn he's like yeah I did my time and I was like damn like I don't even have a 401k <laughs> like <laughs> Like, well, I don't know what's happening right now. And uh, it was, um, it's an interesting moment. It's very, uh, you know, people, uh, I have a, I have a, um, a gentleman who, uh, it's funny when you get, when people inspire you, you speak about them as if you know them. I don't know this man. He passed away last year, but he's one of my favorite preachers. And as a way of getting his message across, he would always tell the story of um, your heart and how you set your expectations and how the end goal is very important to people. And he said, picture, he would, he would always tell the story and I'm going to, I'm going to butcher it, but I'll get it close enough. Um, picture, I think you'll do all right. picture two people and, um, and they both get hired at the same time and they both have the same job. They're separating widgets, right? Or they're doing data entry. It can be anything that sounds menial. 
and um, uh, and one person uh, is told at the beginning of the job for the next year we're going to pay you thirty thousand dollars annually to do this job and you got to be here 35 hours a week and uh, and then the other person they said we're going to pay you three million dollars this year to do this job of separating widgets or data entry and you got to be here 35 hours a week and after one week of the job the two people go out to lunch and they're talking about their experience and you who's getting paid thirty thousand dollars a year sitting there saying this is the worst job i've ever had i can't handle this i'm leaving and then me who's getting paid three million dollars is like i don't know what you're talking about this best job i've ever had um and the concept is simply like what your end expectation is is really going to align how you walk through the entire experience to begin with and we have done a job in this country of um stating what feels like a romantic end goal of you can retire relatively early and you'll have your health care and you'll have your retirement and it just sounds all shitty to me yeah <laughs> right but it's it's romantic well, because tomorrow was in promise amen it's romanticized to the point though where um people that i like who are my friends um i i don't know how they're doing it and especially with remote work which is I can only speak about remote work very hypocritically because I don't have an office. And I, and I, you're a nomad. And I don't go to my office where our company is. Mm-hmm. And when I do go there, I don't have an office there and I don't have a desk and I have no filing cabinets, <laughs> right? My entire life is on my laptop. That's it. That's how I survive. Um, so I don't go to work. But we now have, and this is this is a very challenging thing for me because um, I spent the last 12 years of my life investing into our core downtowns, right? I'm a downtown urban guy. I'm famous in my in my small circle um, for hating places like Clifton Park. And there's nothing wrong with Clifton Park sure. other than everything. And- um, <laughs> <laughs> No comment. <laughs> yeah, but like I love, like I love downtowns, right? And the thing we had going in the downtowns before I started working was we had um, we had a lot of state workers who could backfill space and be on the street and provide economic benefits, and they aren't there anymore. And I'm watching these neighborhoods and these places that um, you know we throw around the word um, renaissance too often without realizing that the word renaissance is supposed to be capitalized, right? It's a, yep. it's a big important thing that's happening. We use it too easily, but we had a good little run for 15 years. And it feels like it's being threatened right now by a number of different factors. Yeah. Um, and I'm and I'm freaking rambling. I literally was just like, what am I even talking about right now? Oh, I like it. No, I honestly, I was talking to somebody about um, downtown um, from years ago. When I first started singing in the area, I graduated college in 2000. Yep. Came back up here. You could get a cab downtown and walk up and down the street between Pearl, South Pearl and Broadway and hit 20 clubs with yeah. live music. Yep. It was a wild time. It was a great time. Lark Street. Yeah. I, I remember one of the times we had the cab take us from Lark Street to South Pearl and not realizing how close it was. And the cab driver was like, okay. And we're like, oh shit. Yeah, we could have fucking walked that. Yeah. Sorry. But yeah. like you could hit, there was live music at all these different places. And not only are there not as many um venues they're like i mean if there are venues there's not music like you know as as often as there was and then you just see like you know like savannah's Mm. it's a daycare center which is kind of appropriate you know it always was right i mean i worked (laughs) there i'm like we're not far off you know but it's just like i remember when they when they shut it and did that and it oh i felt like I mean, I cut my teeth there. Yeah. So I felt like that was just so sad to me. And I'm wondering, like, you know, what what is your vision for downtown? What do you think? Is- so same experience, right? I, I saw you perform back in 2003 and 2004 and lived off of Lark Street and lived in downtown Troy. And, like, my 21st birthday was literally at Jillian's, right? Like, Okay. And now I own the building. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like... And we just put a bunch of apartments in there, and it's weird, right? And I'm and I'm happy I'm happy to sit here and talk to you about it because we already laid the groundwork for I'm a real estate developer who doesn't care about 
uh, money. So like, let's look at what this downtown was and why couldn't it sustain itself, right? Can we answer that question? Um, predominantly, it didn't sustain itself because while live music and clubs are incredibly engaging in an urban area, they have to be engaging in a way where that downtown has to exist for 18 hours, right? Yeah. And so we had a downtown that was only alive for five or six hours a day. And then when people like you and I grew up um, and some of us stopped drinking. Sorry. And others <laughs> and others had families. I always joke that I would put places out of business yeah. when I got well, sober. But but you did. And, it's, and you didn't even need to get sober to do it, right? You got sober. And I went into business and started doing crazy things. And other people had families. Yeah. And without without uh, an infrastructure in that downtown that was 18 hours long, you didn't have any sustainability to what was a generational experience, yeah. right? Like our generation experienced Albany this way, but it wasn't like it was Nashville, right? Sure. Where like where you have an unbelievable amount of people that are participating in the economy and it works. Yeah. So when people's behaviors change, right? And now like you go look at Saratoga and it's humming, right? Like because that's where the behavior moved to. So when when I started getting into it, like I read a lot of books about walkability and the concept of urban development. And like I'm a self-taught urban planner. Um, and all of it really revolves around, can we build this 18 hour downtown? So when people ask me what I'm most proud of, and I gave you the number, like we've done $300 million, but you know what I'm most proud of that I've done? What? I got Upstate Concert Hall to move out of Clifton Park. All right. And nothing nothing makes me more proud. I love that. So you spending 2 years trying to convince Ted Teddy to listen <laughs> and to like to like move hey babe. to a hey babe to move to downtown Albany because like we can't be cool as a region if the only legitimate rock club we have is in a strip mall yeah. in Clifton Park yeah. where you have one place you can go to eat. Yep and nothing you can walk to, right? Like that can't be your experience. And that place is a fucking dungeon. Oh, it's the worst. It can't, that can't be your culture, yeah. right? And, and so when we, when we started the project down here, um, you know, my partners, bless their souls, would just build apartments all day long if they could. There would be no, no retail. And yeah. so I'm the biggest problem with the company because the retail is the hardest thing. Um, but I was like, look, I, I knew Ted like 15 years ago, and I know a couple people that are involved up there. Let me just go start having a conversation. And I can't say enough about Ted and Dave and Jen and Stan, who they took a leap. And I'm gonna tell you a story that you're going to love because okay. Upstate Concert Hall like was a dump, but it was our dump, sure. right? Like it was like, you go there and well, you the knew- I unidentified dripping water Yeah, on it occasion. had a vibe, right? Yeah. And so I was like, look, we're gonna put you in the space where the old cap rep is. And Ted, who never pulls any punches, yeah. was like, what the hell are you going to do? And we all walked into the room. And I was like, so we're just going to demo every wall you see in here. And then we'll have a big room that we can have shows in. And, like, I have my bona fides, right? Like, I can say, like, I used to go up there to see the clay people, right? Like, that was, like, a hardcore kid who, like, loved all this crazy music. And then, like... Now I literally spend my entire existence traveling around the country seeing live music. It's what I do. Mm -hmm. I spend all of my disposable income on live music so I can talk the game. Um, you know, they were willing to have the conversation. We signed a lease for the space, and this is the boldest thing I've ever done. I didn't have any idea whether this space would work as a rock club because we didn't tear the walls down. But I had to get them hooked yeah. before we tore all the walls so down. you sold it. So I sold it. And That's I remember, impressive. I remember telling Dave, um, who you know, Dave, Dave and Jen are running the show, right? And uh, I remember telling Dave, like, just come back, four weeks, we'll have the demo done, we can go in. And um, four weeks later, they come down. I was like, deep breath. I have no idea what this shit is going to look like, and I didn't tell anybody this. Well, because I mean, even though you had been developing that for a while, the the transition did seem pretty hasty. It was oh, yeah. like. Whew, like one shut down, one open. Yeah. Like it did, it did yep. happen like yep. pretty quickly. And we all walked in and I was like, oh, thank God, this is unbelievable. <laughs> and I look at Ted and he's like, this is going to be the greatest thing ever, right? Oh. Like, and that has made an incredible impact in Albany where people aren't really truly understanding it yet because everything else is, yeah. is limping along. But those guys are crushing it over there. And, you yeah. know, 
I don't make any money on it, but what an unbelievable thing that is for the region to have that club in a downtown humming every night. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, if you could just do something about the parking. What about it? <laughs> there just needs to be a little bit more of it. Oh, shit. I think I forgot to pay my uh, meter, too. Yeah. So. It's a city, though, right? I know. I'm just fucking around. But it's it's a good comment, though, right? Because like places that are easily accessible yeah. thrive. Yeah. And Albany and Troy and Schenectady are challenging. But I think we're getting... I think we're getting better at it yeah i'm mostly being facetious and just being an asshole yeah i have it's hard for me to receive that joke because everybody complains about it all the time oh yeah so it's like you're joking but most people yeah are. <laughs> <laughs> well within every uh joke lies a little bit of, of course of truth yeah. so um i did want to um one other thing that I wanted to discuss with you before we wrap it up, um, the the warehouse. You yeah. are you are thoroughly invested in that eyesore that's been sitting there for Yeah. I think I bought drugs there like twenty years ago. Is that possible? Maybe thirty. Thirty? No. How dare you? <laughs> um <laughs> I love that building. It's hard to love something that's so ugly. Yeah. Um you can just ask any of my exes. Uh, um, I, well, sh- see that? I could be a comedian. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I broke in there a couple of years ago. Um, so I followed all the stories in the newspaper and, I, and I'm riding my bike one day. I'm a big bike rider. And uh, I drove by it and I was like, I'm going to get a couple people. We're going to break in here. Really, I just wanted a couple people with me because I had no idea who I was going to encounter inside. And uh, we broke in, a bunch of us. And we walked around. I instantly fell in love with it because um, I love the region. I, I genuinely do, even though it aggravates me to no end. Um, and we got all the way to the top floor. And I'm sad that no one's going to experience this um, because we don't have a lot of places in the region that have one acre of land, 12 stories in the air with nothing impeding on the view right there's no other big buildings around it so the view of downtown is incredible the view of the catskills is incredible the adirondacks is amazing and i just created this project in my head that was apartments and like a carnival on the roof and it made sense financially it made sense Mm -hmm. two years ago and then the world started you know to go to hell a little bit and interest rates went through the roof and you know, the dirty little secret of urban development in upstate New York is that all the work that you've seen done over the past 15 years is a direct result of interest rates being low. Um, and now that they are not low anymore, you've seen a lot of the work grind to a halt. Yeah. Um, so I had a, you know, I've had a, co- a few conversations with myself about this and I've come to a place of peace with it, which is um, I told everyone that I would fix the central warehouse. Uh, and the reality is like the central warehouse is just a problem in its existence. And so even though we can't fix it, tearing it down is a fix. Yeah. Um, and you know, thankfully I think we found a group that can recycle all the concrete. So we're not being wasteful. Okay. My big problem with demolition is how wasteful it is. Um, and you know, hopefully by the end of next year, so by the end of 25, that building is gone and scraped and we have a nice parcel there and I will be For totally- parking. Yeah, for, for parking for Empire Live. Um, I'll be very sad when that happens because um, I put a lot into it. Yeah. Um, but it's time. You got to know once enough. Well, that's what I like to do. I like to end on a sour note. I want yeah, to no, just bring you it's down. Yeah, no, smart thing to do. Depress the shit out of you. <laughs> it's good. We're fine. Do you want to Do you want to end on a happier note? Um. <laughs> There's plenty of happy I things in the it. world. I blew it. I blew it. We had a well, great winner. Yeah. Um, you love small talk. I do. Do you want to go for a ride in the elevator? Kind of. Um, <laughs> I don't like what. What? What's next for you? What? Oh, you know, I love. If I'm going to talk to somebody, I always like teasing something, right? Because okay. why am I? Why are we spending time together if we're not breaking news? Sure. Because there's always news to break. Um, I did a pitch yesterday with someone uh, locally looking for uh, seed funding for a startup that I would run um, that has absolutely nothing to do with real estate and everything to do with storytelling. And um, I think it went pretty well and I need to refine what that looks like, but I would be super happy to exit real estate and just be a full-time storyteller. 
That's, so, it'd be so much fun. That's a good place to stop because I feel like you and I need to meet again. I can say stay tuned and then like I we think can we just, do need to say yeah. stay tuned. Everybody that I talk to, I'm always like, we have to do this again. Yeah. Because we're only scratching the surface. Always. But this has been amazing. And cool. thank you so much for finding yeah. the time. And uh, we're going to go have a chicken sandwich. Um, Mistress of Naan. Mistress of Naan. <laughs> I'm going to make you some Naan on the yeah. stovetop. On the stovetop. <laughs> Because my oven shit. Yeah. And um, thank you really so much for meeting with me. And I hope we get the chance to talk again. Awesome. All right. You've been listening to The Mistress of None uh, with uh, Jeff Buell has been my guest today. And my name is Aaron Harks. And we will be right back. You're listening to The Mistress of None podcast with Aaron Harks. Welcome back to the Mistress of None. This is Aaron Harks. Uh, that was a super fun interview. So nice to sit down with him. I could honestly, I feel like this with a lot of the guests that I have, I'm, I'm lucky that I get to pick them. But um, he, I, I felt like he and I could have spoken all day, honestly. Like we talked even out to the car and it was just like, ah, we have to get together again soon. Uh, he was great. Uh, he does wonderful things. I could see us working together again in the future. And I'm looking forward to that. Um, yeah, one thing that's been weighing on me a little bit lately is something has shifted. And it's not just me. So this actually made me feel a little bit better. I've been talking to other people that have been producing shows. And people have stopped buying tickets and aren't coming out and it's made my job obviously a lot harder like of all the times in my life to make this transition of moving into a career that is solely successful based on how many tickets I sell and so that's kind of what also threw me into this bit of a a tizzy just for lack of a better term So I'm going to investigate that a little bit. Again, I know that it's not just me. I talk to some other people that produce comedy shows and some other people that do similar things. And they said it's happening like across the country. And I'm not sure what that is, but I'm going to keep an eye on it. And in the meantime, I'm going to be like the reluctant retailer and be resourceful and, you know, figure shit out because I am too self-employed to go back to work for anybody else. I am an outdoor cat now. And I will scratch your eyes out. (laughs) Uh, Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I will do my best to make this a weekly thing. I hope that you all tune in. Uh, Don't forget, Wednesday's coming up. This will come out on... Yes, so tonight, Katie O'Burns. Hopefully it's sold out by the time we talk because the room's only got like 40 people in it. So if I can't sell that out, then... There's definitely something wrong. Maybe it's the um, anniversary of the pandemic that has people all freaked out or something. I don't know. There's so many theories. I'm curious to hear what you think it might be. Um, so March 20th, tonight, 7.30, Katie O'Burns, headliner Liz Barrett. You can get tickets on my website where you can get all the tickets to everything all the time. Uh, next Wednesday, Cafe Lena, Lena Go Round. Uh, they have approved this to continue. I had four shows to see if it worked or not. And by the second show, she liked it and wanted to keep going. So it's going to keep going. But we are taking the summer off because Saratoga is a bit wild in the summer. And it's just a lot. So we're going to pick back up in the fall. So we're going to do um, March, April, and May pick back up in September but I'm going to be there in the middle of the summer almost smack dab in the middle of the summer July 12th with a whole new solo show just me and I'm um, working on some new songs and hopefully some new recordings by then so if you came to see me at Cafe Lena last year it won't be the same show uh, there'll be some of the same songs because you know I'm not a maniac I can't write that many but that's July 12th uh, the tickets will be available very soon on my website And then as every first Wednesday of the month, Women Aren't Funny at UPH, we've got uh, Karen Rontowski coming back April 4th, April 3rd, April 3rd, April 3rd. She's great. Uh, Again, tickets on my website. Check that out. 
it's going to be a fun show. I've got some fun people coming out. And I appreciate everybody that's been coming out so far. And I hope that if you're listening, you'll come out and you'll tell your friends, tell your enemies. I don't care. Just tell, tell, tell. Like, listen, follow all that bullshit. And um, tune back next week. I don't know who the guest will be. I think I know who it'll be, but just in case, I'm not going to say. You just have to tune in and find out. Uh, Follow me on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and all that shit at Mistress of None or at Aaron Harks. And my website is AaronHarks.com. Thank you all so much. Be nice to one another and I'll see you soon. Love you all. Bye-bye. You're listening to the Mistress of None podcast with Aaron Harks.